Hello and welcome. Uh, this is a video about the combat lessons and the universal tactics in Soul Calibur 6, which I am going to read through and explain so that you guys don't have to. So first of all, I'm going to read everything on this list. And I'm going to try and break it down a little bit to what I know, um, if, if I can, afterwards, like a, a, after I've finished each section. So, introduction. This book is a collection of ancient manuscripts in the art of combat that were written in one of the Holy Roman Empire's great citadels. The writings were said to have been penned by practitioners of the sword, who put their illustrations, masters, techniques, uh, teachings to paper. Sadly, it appears that most have been lost, while others have notes adorning them made by the hands of others. The originals detail techniques designed for adepts who have already gone through practical training. So many fundamental motions go largely unmentioned. With this book being a selection of said works, a reader seeking to find information on the basic handling of weapons shall find it wanting. Given that various notes and adjustments to the manuscripts are attributable to later scholars, it is often difficult to discern the original author's intentions. However, as a, warrior, as a window into the thoughts and philosophies of an ancient warrior heading into battle, hopefully these writings can be of use. That bit is a ball egg to read. <laughs> Lesson 1. Strike first. Survival on the battlefield can be summed up thusly. Attack and prevent your opponent from attacking. In other words, strike first. Even the most stalwart of warriors flinch and break their stance when struck. I'm not on camera. Hello. <laughs> and every second they spend recoiling from an attack is a second they cannot attack you. If they can't attack you, they can't hurt you, and so forestalling your opponent is the key to survival. Skilled warriors strike quickly, unbalance their foes, and don't let up until their enemies are defeated. Before all else, you must think to yourself, how can I strike before I'm struck? Firstly, and most importantly, do not swing your weapon carelessly. Swing it with thought. Keep this simple mantra in your heart. Stay calm in the heat of battle, and may you very well live long enough to grow into a hardened warrior. Some of these are very wordy, as you may have noticed. Uh, lesson two, choose your distance. <clears throat> uh, as this one, this one's not square. If history has taught us anything, it is that on the battlefield, one's weapon is one's life. The world's minds have conjured up all manner of weapons, but what matters most is how each weapon allows its wielder to strike the opponent first. Consider the weapon's size and length. A larger weapon suits those who seek to slay the enemy forcefully before they are upon them. Beware, though, such weapons are weighty and thus slower. Smaller, lighter weapons, however, allow for fast kills at close quarters. Remember, there is no absolutely perfect weapon. A weapon's aptness, aptness, sorry, a weapon's aptness depends on the circumstances of battle. You must discover what distance from your opponent your weapon performs best. Longer, larger weapons work well further away, whereas shorter, lighter ones will serve you at close range, providing you can evade your opponent's attacks long enough to strike. Know thyself, know thine enemy. Do all you can in the best way you can, there is no quicker way of reaching your true potential. So, as that says there, breaking that one down, it's about distance and close quarters, it's quite self-explanatory lighter weapons are quicker bigger weapons are a lot more deadly but slower um and it's all about look sort of judging your range um and your and what the enemy's going to, to do with that range you know watch your surroundings the battlefield requires all of your guile to survive those who enter stake their lives on winning gone are the concepts of good and evil one's cause is justified by one thing and one thing alone victory know your battlefield use everything it provides you victory is not simply a matter of injuring your opponent should you be by the water side unbalance your opponent and let them take a bath should your back be against the wall step sideways let an aggressive opponent throw themselves at the mortar be ever aware of both your own and your opponent's positions and movements work with your surroundings and they shall work with you such harmony can see you fell foes of far greater strength keep your eyes on your opponent and use your peripheral vision well so again this is learning your stage learning your environment right so yeah exactly as it says sometimes you might be really down on life you might be on your last segment about to die but you might get the crucial uh launcher or ring out that you need just by th using his momentum to run at you you sidestep and take him down uh i've won matches like that in every soul caliber game it is it's just a thing in soul caliber so 
definitely keep an eye on your environment. We'll go over more of that. It will come. It will come to more in depth conversation about environment when we get further through. Lesson four: Deal more damage in one blow. Strikes that scratch the surface of the skin will not be enough to slay an opponent. When one fells a tree, one must strike with all of one's might. Felling an opponent is no different. However, landing a decisive blow is easier said than done. First, examine the techniques your way of fighting has to offer. Sorry, I'll slow down there. For example, which are the fa which are fast and test your opponent, which are devastating but take time to perform. Speed and power do not go hand in hand. You must understand what your techniques allow you to do. Once you know this, select attacks that prevent your opponent from defending when they land, send them into the air or prevent them from moving, then unleash your fury. When the hedgehog has revealed its soft underbelly, the fox claims its meal. You would do well to remember this. <clears throat> so far, hi Two-Face, how you doing man? Um, I'm just going to read through these lessons and help people. So again, with this one, deal more damage in one blow, as it says at the end of that, um, it's understanding what moves you have and when to use what move. You know, are they really guarding a lot? We need to use guard break. Are they stepping a lot? I need to cut them off. It's that kind of thing. Um, trap them, stop combo them, stop them from teching, stop them from air controlling. That's kind of the point it's getting to. Each of those concepts we will again get to further in this like guide. Lesson five, restrict, uh, yeah, restrict your enemy's movement. Even the safest of attacks can be costly if done recklessly. Uh, they may be guarded or evaded with ease, leaving you ripe for the kill. Brand the following five tenets into your minds. 1. Restrict your enemy's movements, making it easier for you to attack. Put your opponent on the back foot with quick strikes. 2. Straight attacks can be evaded sideways, putting you in a vulnerable position. Use a horizontal attack to stop your opponent in their tracks first before unleashing them. There is, uh, number 3. There is no value to an attack that carves through nothing but air. All your opponent has to do against attacks that barely reach is step back. Instead, utilize long-range attacks such as charging thrusts to limit your opponent's options. Number four, a fallen opponent is a sitting duck. Use moves that knock them down and then follow up with an attack. This is one of the quickest ways to make sure they stay down. Never go for, uh, sorry, number five, never go for a huge strike without making sure you have your opponent under control. When you have them exactly where you want them, unleash your full power. So what that's saying obviously there is a bit like I mentioned previously, uh, you know, slow your enemy with strict, uh, quick strikes, keep them, keep them on the defense. Uh, don't use too many verticals because they will step you and it makes you vulnerable. Um, so kind of think about that before you unleash it, as it says. Um, don't whiff, which is point number three. Try not to whiff as much because they can just whiff punish you so easily for it. So if you do a charge attack, they are forced on like a, a stun break situation or a guard break situation where they're like forced and stunned on block. So then that limits their options, right? And if they're down and they're a sitting duck, um, then use moves to, to follow up, you know, hit them on the ground or try and wake them up somehow. And then number five, um, basically, yeah, don't whiff big, big moves either. I'm guessing that's as well going to refer to like don't whiff a critical edge unless you're sure you can land it. Lesson six, destroy ironclad defenses. See an opponent who guards relentlessly as an opportunity to go on the offense. But what if your attacks never seem to get through their defense? Or worse, you are forced into a disadvantageous, disadvantageous position. In that case, vary your techniques. Make your opponent think you'll strike to the face, but go low. Strikes of varied heights are more difficult to defend against. You can even throw your opponent. If they use a shield to thwart your weapon, pin them down, leaving them open to a deadly strike. Changing the rhythm of your attacks works well. The most experienced of warriors skip a beat before striking, tempting their opponent into relaxing their guard before the true final blow falls. The true blow falls, sorry. The last one standing on the battlefield is not necessarily the strongest. Those flexible of mind avoid death. Change, they say, is good for the soul. It can save your life too. So that is, as I say, mix things up. Don't use the same kind of timing. Don't be predictable and just try and change how you, you know, what kind of tactics. Don't flow chart. Change your, change your mix up and change your game quite often to keep the enemy guessing, you know. Lesson seven, mind games. Brute force is not the only way to open your opponent's defense and land a decisive blow. Battle hardy warriors uh, aim to break down their opponents psychologically before going for the jugular. One of the ways to do this is to goad them into attacking. Once successful, defend and then counter. For example, you can intentionally perform a strike that the opponent can defend against, 
uh, tempting them to unleashing a f powerful attack that leaves them open. Should your opponent get carried away and go for a head-on attack, dodge to the side and respond with a powerful blow of your own. Make the opponent think they have you in their head, then use their hubris against them. Even the smartest of uh, sorry, even the smallest of gaps can be exploited if you see them coming. But remember that even with the psychological battle won, the actual battle is still in the balance. Veteran warriors keep all exchanges, even those that they lose, in mind to forge new strategies. So what that says again is bait your enemies. Maybe bait them with an A attack or an A A sidestep. They're gonna they're gonna maybe tr potentially hit with a B. You punish their whiff with a B yourself, and maybe you launch into a combo perhaps. That's what the idea is behind that. And just generally, yeah, baiting them into doing something that then you can control because then you know what that you know you can plan ahead and set them up. That's what the point of that sort of is with the mind game. There's more way more to it with mind games with conditioning um, things like. Uh, you know, trying to make your enemy duck so you can go for a mid, so you keep going for lows until they duck low and then you hit them with a mid. All of that comes into it. Uh, beginner 1. Movement with 8-way run. Note all explanations are based on the default button settings, so if you change your buttons then, you know, it will be a bit different, <laughs> I would imagine. But I'm just going to go on what it says and on the default notation, uh, default button settings. Number one, positioning yourself with 8-way run, use the D-pad or your, I think potentially your analog stick on your controller or your arcade stick if you've got one. Um, so use that to move around freely to take your preferred fighting stance. The 8-way run is useful for getting out of dangerous situations such as having your back to cliffs or walls. Number two, move short distances by stepping. Tap once in a direction to perform a short step in which you can easily transition into another move. You can step in any of the eight directions and you can then hold to be able to move and run in those directions. Try the tutorial missions. We will probably do that on stream as well so you can see it. Um, if not, if you're watching this as a video on YouTube, it might be following this video too. You might be able to see it on my channel. If not, check out my stream. The VOD will be there. The tutorial missions in um, Mission Libra of Soul teach you the basics of battle. Use them to practice the eight-way run if you're having trouble. I'm not going to read these little quotes at the bottom. Beginner 2. Attacking. Vary your attacks. Attack your opponent with A, B, or K. Um, you can also simultaneously press A plus B or B plus K to unleash powerful attacks. Combine with directions and eight-way run to change the type of attack as well. While there is a variation across all fighting styles, A, 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 forward, A, A, B, 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 and forward, B, B, unleash combos. While practicing, get into the habit of pressing the buttons at one at a time instead of mashing them. This may be tricky to do at first, but take your time, you'll eventually get used to it. Number three, check your main moves in the main list, uh, in the move list, not in the main list. Check your main moves in the move list. Go to the pause menu during a battle to access the move list for each fighting style. There may be a lot, but you don't need to use all of them. For the time being, concentrate on the main moves. Eventually, you'll be able to add more moves to your arsenal, a sign that you're making progress. Beginner 3. Different types of attacks. Horizontal and vertical attacks. Uh, a performs, performs a horizontal strike, which is great for hitting opponents while they're using 8-way run and they're trying to move around. B performs a vertical strike, not great at hitting a stepping opponent, but powerful. Uh, K is a combination... Sorry, K and combination button moves may unleash either vertical or horizontal attacks. Uh, three attack heights, number two. High attacks can be blocked with a standing guard and go over the heads of crouching opponents. Mid attacks can be blocked by standing guard but cannot be blocked by crouching guard. Low attacks cannot be blocked with standing uh, but can be blocked with a crouching guard. Other factors to consider. Each attack has a varying speed, reach, and power. They also vary in how easily they are to evade and how much they leave you open to attack. Even moves that may seem difficult to use at first can, um, can prove helpful. Figuring out is all part of the fun. Figuring out how, sorry, is part of the fun. I'm sorry I'm butchering this reading. I've, like, I've read it once before and I haven't exactly rehearsed, so I'm just reading it as we go. <clears throat> um, and to summarize for these points, Movement with 8-way run, self-explanatory, I didn't bother to go over that. Attacking, uh, again, it's ex you know the way that I've explained that and the way the game explains it is very simple. It's just a case of practicing and learning to 
to learn how to do the button presses at the right time. As soon as you know how to do an A, A, B, ba, 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 you'll you'll be straight there. That's all it is. The timing isn't as difficult as that makes it sound like it is. You'll you'll be fine. If you played any fighting games like Tekken, this is easy. Uh, different types of attack. I'll go over this as well and summarize. Obviously, A, yeah, horizontal attacks. They're great for people who step. Verticals are harder hitting, but easily vulnerable to step. Uh, combination with A and K or B and K, fair enough, that does combination of vertical or horizontal attacks. Um, there's other different categories of that too, but we'll get into that in a minute. And there's also K attacks, which are kick attacks. That hasn't mentioned that yet. Um, but yeah, K and combination, as it says, either vertical or horizontal, but yeah. So you've got horizontal, vertical, kick, uh, and then combination moves, which can do kind of sort of a mixture. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Next is guarding. Press and hold G to guard. So unlike in Tekken, in this game, you have to actually hold a button to block. Uh, guard protects you from attacks. Release the button to drop your guard. It's your primary defensive technique, so you may want to try holding it whenever you're not moving or attacking. Be careful though, guarding too much might result in your guard being crushed, leaving you open. Finally, it's often quite effective to attack immediately after blocking. The reason for that is because you would probably be trying to punish their attack, depending on the frames. The standing guard. Press and hold G while standing to perform a standing guard. This blocks high and mid attacks, but not lows. Mid, uh, that's a spelling mistake. Middle attacks, it has one D in blue, see it? Middle attacks are particularly powerful in this game, so the standing guard is an invaluable tool to defend against them. The crouching guard. Hold down while holding guard, uh, pressing G, to perform a crouch guard. You can evade high attacks and block low ones, but mids will hit you. If you think your opponent will throw or attack low, quickly perform a crouching guard. Additionally, you can use this move to evade a high attack in your opponent's combo. So if they're doing an AAA and it's high, 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 you can you probably block the first two, duck the third one with crouching guard. Reversal edge. Our reversal edge counters. This is a new mechanic introduced into this game, um, whereby you can reverse enemy attacks and force them into a 50-50 rock paper scissors mix up. Countering an offensive player with a reversal edge. In battle, it can be difficult to know whether your opponent will attack middle or low. If you have trouble deciding how to guard, press R1 to perform a reversal edge. Um, you will go into a special stance that allows, to, allows you to block high, mid, and low attacks. Once your opponent has finished their offense, you will automatically counter. If the counter lands, you transition into a reversal edge clash and can potentially deal even more damage. Number two, time your counters. Press and hold R1 to stay in the special stance longer, therefore extending the amount of time you can defend. Even if your opponent goes for a 2 or 3 input combo, you will block it. By holding the button for as long as possible, you can move into a clash even if your reversal edge counter is blocked. Uh, some attacks can't be blocked. While a reversal edge allows you to block all sorts of attacks, including throws, some attacks can't be defending against. <coughs> defended against. Sorry. Namely, break attacks, which are wreathed in blue lightning, and unblockable attacks, which are wreathed in red flames. To look at it another way, you can utilize these moves against an opponent using reversal edge against you. Okay, so as it says, reversal edge is a countering mechanic whereby you can press it once if they do one hit, and then you instantly counter once you release, or you can hold it uh, and hold it for three, four, you know, two, three, four, five hits, and then release it, and then still get the counter on them, depending if you know what string they're doing. Um, it says R1, but the other notation that you can use in-game if you've changed your controls, which I will tell you, is uh, Y plus G. No, sorry, B plus G. B plus G. Um, and yeah, with if you have an opponent that is using a lot of reversal edges on you, I had this in the beta and I didn't know how to deal with it, reversal edge... Uh, as, a, as it's standing, just as a raw attack, can be stepped really easily. It's really linear. But if they counter your string with a, re with a reversal edge, they force you into it. Um, which, that's kind of hard to deal with. I haven't learned how to fully get around that yet. You can then deal with that particular mix-up by blocking and then stepping, I guess, when you're in the 50-50. But if you've got an opponent that will spam reversal edge all the time, keeps trying it on you, uh, then yeah, you learn your break attacks, which are usually A plus Bs. That's your default. A plus B is your default break attack with most characters. They all have different ones too that are individual moves. 
And then from there, if you know what your break attacks are, and then you know this dude keeps spamming reversal edge, even though he's whiffing it as well over there, he just keeps doing it. Bam! Break attack. That's what I would go for. Or an unblockable if you've got one, and you know it. Um, that's just my little tip. That's, that's how I, you know. Since I learned that, I found that reversal edge to be less of a problem um, because of the counter attacks that I've got with my breaks and my unblockables. So... Uh, beginner six this is a more in-depth reversal edge clashes the three-way triangle of reversal edge clash when one fighter successfully lands a reversal edge both sides will move to create space between each other and enter a special sparring phase during this phase press a b or k to unleash a special move that will determine whether you win or lose the phase with each move being strong against one type and weak to another type a attacks beat k attacks K attacks beat B attacks, and B attacks beat A attacks. Each fighter's style also impacts the strength of their A, B, and K attacks. With enough practice and knowledge about each uh, of the fighting styles, you'll be able to read your opponent's moves and predict how they'll act during reversal edge clash. Guarding and reversal edge clash. If you're not sure which move to execute during a reversal edge clash, you can press G to guard and momentarily fend off your opponent's attack. However, be warned, if you attempt to guard when your opponent uses a B attack, the clash will restart and enter a second round. Additionally, if your guard stamina is low when attempting to guard during a reversal edge clash, your opponent may be able to crush your guard. Taking evasive maneuvers. If you're confident uh, about whether your opponent will use an A, B, or K attack during a reversal edge clash, you can evade the attack altogether by pressing a direction to move out of the way, with each direction enabling you to dodge a different attack. Forward steps will move you out of the way of A attacks, while side step will get you away from B attacks, and a back step will move you out of reach from K attacks. Evading during a reversal edge clash is a major gamble, however, while successfully dodging an attack will put you in a prime position to dish out major damage, if you guess their attack incorrectly and move the wrong way, you'll take the hit. So yeah, it's a, a reversal edge uh, is a three-way rock, paper, scissors with A, B, and K, and then obviously the added element of being able to step and evade if you wish, but you can get beaten out of it. So it's, as it says, each one in a, in a sort of a circle or a triangle, if you like, each one beats each one. Um, so, you know, it's useful to remember which one will beat which. So the fact that horizontal will beat kick, kick beats a vertical, uh, but vertical will beat a horizontal. Um, that will just take a while of us playing to get used to that stuff. So we'll see. But yeah, I'll be able to go over more of that in depth back in the actual practice room in a moment when we go back to play. And then I can show we can set up the dummy and go through a little bit of how reversal edge physically works when you see it, because sometimes you need to see it, I think. But that's just the explanation at least. Beginner seven, critical edges. Cr uh, critical edges are a deadly trump card. When you've built up at least one soul gauge, you can press R2 by default to execute a critical edge. If it successfully lands, you'll deal massive damage to your opponent, making it a key asset in your offense arsenal as a fighter. Fighting style effects on critical edges. Critical edges have different properties depending on the fighting style that's used. You can learn more about these different properties and how to apply them by consulting your character fighting styles in this combat lessons menu. Uh, quickly building up the soul gauge. The faster you can build up soul gauge, the more opportunities you'll have to execute critical edges that can lead you to victory in battle. To that end, while attacking and taking damage as normal will slowly build up a soul gauge over time, pulling off reversal edges is one way to expedite the process and accumulate a lot of soul gauge very quickly. So yeah, as that says, different fighting styles and different characters mean different critical edges. A critical edge for Tekken players in the chat is like a rage art in Tekken. It's a super. It's a cutscene finishing move, right? Um, and it can be punished. It can be massively punished on whiff. And the quickest way to build up that soul gauge, as I did in the beta, is to keep using reversal edge, which then after, if, if you're successful with it, will just boost your meter really quickly. So that is something that is worth noting that you can, even if you don't like the reverse ledge mechanic, you can use it to get a lot of soul gauge, and that will help you then pull off critical edges or soul charges in battle if you need them. 
Begin at 8, Mastering Soul Charges. Soul Charges, a powerful comeback in dire situations. When you fill up at least one Soul Gauge, press back an R2 to trigger a Soul Charge. In this state, you'll be able to unleash special Soul Charge moves that are more powerful than your normal attacks for a limited time. Plus, even if your opponent tries to guard your attack, your hits will cause chip damage and drain their life, enabling you to stay on the offensive. Desperate times call for desperate measures. When you activate a soul charge, your, uh, the soul gauge will turn into a timer that displays the amount of time remaining before its effects will dissipate. Uh, the shock wave that's triggered when a soul charge is first activated will also push the opposing fighter away. Soul charges have a variety of defensive uses as well. Not only can they be used to interrupt strong attacks from your opponent, they also freeze the uh, round timer when activated which will prevent you from losing by your opponent running out the clock or simply running out of time when you attack. Mastery of all these different applications will therefore help you go far in battle. Soul Charge versus Critical Edge. Critical Edge can deal lots of damage within a short amount of time, making them very potent in the short term when used effectively. In contrast, Soul Charges won't necessarily make that big of a difference with respect to damage output but they come with a variety of other benefits uh, that can make them useful in their own right under certain circ uh, certain conditions think wisely as you decide when and how to spend your soul gauge on the path to victory <clears throat> so to break this one down uh, soul charge yeah as it says soul charge you can use as a defensive measure to push the enemy away so if they're getting too aggressive and you don't think you can land a critical edge in time you can get a soul charge in which will push them away from you um, and activate you into soul charge which gives you special techniques you don't have normally uh, any vet returning veterans will get used to some of their old moves now only being available in soul charge Killick is a good example of this, where he has a move that used to hit multiple times from left to right with his uh, with his staff. He can only now do this move in Soul Charge, and it's you hold uh, back B B B B K to do the Ender. Um, that used to be just a generic move for Killick, and is now only available in Soul Charge. Um, and also a versus critical edge critical edge is a rage art super that will do you you know a big chunk of damage straight away but soul charge might play the long game it might get you the advantage in battle with the additional moves you have and the new properties rather than one fixed chunk straight away so that's the difference it's your down to you to learn how and when you're going to use that if you're backed in a corner, maybe you'll use Soul Charge to get out. Um, maybe you'll sidestep with and Critical Edge a move, which is what I do. Um, and that's how I decide if I feel like I can get a Critical Edge, I will. If I need to use the, the Soul Charge, I will. It depends. It's situational. So I'm just going to move down here. Okay, so we're on... This one, right? Strikes. Intermediate one. Strikes and the eight-way run. Horizontal attacks and orientation. Horizontal attacks can easily hit an opposing fighter while they're moving in eight-way run, but they tend to deal only minor damage. In comparison, vertical attacks can be evaded with eight-way run, but if they successfully connect, they can down the opponent and be used to start combos. Put another way, horizontal attacks are easy to land and keep your opponent's movements in check, while vertical attacks are a fighter's bread and butter for dealing damage, major damage. Oh. Too far, too far. Reading your opponent. As you might guess, getting a KO requires you to dish out lots of damage to the opposing fighter. Given their high damage output, it's therefore important to carefully consider when, where, and how you're going to utilize vertical attacks during a match. Naturally, any good opponent will be thinking about the same thing, making it simul similarly crucial to consider how to avoid and counteract their vertical attacks too. In this manner, horizontal attacks, vertical attacks, and the eight-way running form yeah, sorry, an eight-way running form the basics of combat. Being able to anticipate all three during a fight is key to survival and victory. Eight-way run attacks. As mentioned before, eight-way runs are a crucial defensive maneuver that enable you to sidestep oncoming vertical attacks. Obviously, though, you can't win merely by just dodging attacks. Successfully using the eight-way run to avoid a vertical attack will provide an opening for you to counter-attack with your own vertical from the eight-way run and damage your opponent. While running... As you press and hold a direction, press an attack button to perform an eight-way run attack. So yeah, as that mean, as that says, the breakdown on this that I will give <clears throat> is obviously you know about we've already mentioned about horizontal attacks, but being able to eight-way run and do a, a horizontal attack gives you movement 
and a horizontal, not just a standing horizontal. You've been able to uh, possibly whiff, make the opponent whiff with your movement and then into a horizontal kind of tracking move to, to catch them. So especially if they've whiffed and then they've tried to move, you're, you're just dancing around and catching each other. Um, and then reading your opponent, yeah, consider when and where you're going to use your verticals. I whiff a lot, it will happen, you know. <laughs> it just, yeah, it's just going to come with practice kind of thing. And eight-way run attacks are attacks you can do while moving and while running. So you can, you know, step and run to the left and do a vertical and get a big launch on it. Things like that. It's very prevalent in Soul Calibur. Um, so you're going to see me do it a lot with Killick and Sophie. Uh, eight-way run B, it does a launcher. I can combo off it. Bada bing, bada boom, you know? So, again, something you will learn with the game once you've learned more uh, and had more time in it, and once you've picked up and learned your character more. Air combos, immediate 2.1. Uh, combos are a series of attacks that are strung together in order to deal out large damage. Air combos are particularly powerful as they lift the enemy off the ground and make them defenseless against your onslaught. There are often plenty of opportunities to launch air combos that present themselves throughout a match. Beginning a combo. To start an air combo, you first need uh, to land a starting attack that will launch your opponent into the air. You can do this by inputting um, down forward B or otherwise known as 3B, I had to, sorry, I had to double check that, 3B or down forward B, to you, uh, using any fighting style. The important thing to remember about combos is that you should input the next move you want to make in advance before your current one is finished in order to properly continue with the combo and accumulate damage. For specific combos that you can perform after the launching attack connects, consult the move list for your character. Uh, number three, performing strong air combos. While the opposing fighter is in the air, they can't guard against your attacks. However, once they take an attack from you, they gain aerial control, which allows them to determine where they fall. Thus, it's ideal to land one high damage attack before that happens in order to maximize an air combo's potential. Having said that, some attacks can knock enemies down to the ground or lift them back up in the air without granting them air control. Discovering these properties can help you unleash stronger, more effective air combos that allow you to retain control of a round for longer. So summarizing this is obviously, yeah, we mentioned earlier about combos and inputting the moves. Uh, your launchers are all 6B. Everyone has a 6B as far as I know, as it says. That's like a default launcher or down forward B. Um, and then it's learning your strings that will connect. Uh, to test that, you need to make sure that when you're in the lab, you select your opponent to have air control and second action to guard and things like that to be able to test if it's a real combo and not a fake infinite. Because um, if they can move out of it, then it won't be a full combo. It might not be guaranteed. So you have to make sure that you train in the right way so you don't get the wrong idea on a combo. Uh, strong combos for aerial control. So there are some moves, as like in Tekken, whereby you will spike the enemy down and they cannot tech roll they cannot air control or move out of it and that will give you a guaranteed follow-up similar if you understand that sort of setup in tekken you will understand exactly what that is here but yeah as i say the simplicity of it is you would spike an enemy down and from that they are they cannot use air control or any tech roll and then you can gain a follow-up free from that where that will depend on your character my cat's outside meowing wow Air combos. Uh, stun combos. Air combos aren't your only option for stringing together attacks. Another way to start a combo involves stunning an opponent. This happens when a yellow when yellow zigzags appear after an opponent has been struck. Yellow zigzags? Really? It's like it looks like yellow lightning around them. I thought that sounded cooler, but yellow zigzags. Alright. This happens when yellow zigzags appear after an opponent has been struck which signif signify they've become momentarily paralyzed. While stunned, a fighter is typically rendered completely defenseless. Attacking them while they're in this state will trigger a stun combo. <clears throat> stun combo special properties. In a stun combo, a follow-up attack is treated as a counter hit. As a result, every move that can be used in a combo during counter hits can be performed during stun combos as well. However, in a stun combo, each attack will only stun once, meaning that you have to use different attacks in order to keep your opponent immobile. 
down follow-up attacks. Another way to dish out a combo is by using attack, using an attack that knocks an opposing fighter to the ground or away from you, and then following up with additional hits after the initial strike. Nevertheless, these combos aren't foolproof uh, and are best used sparingly as they can be countered by the opponent performing a ukemi to evade your attacks. <laughs> I was laughing at zigzag. <laughs> So yeah, to follow up on this, again, it talks about stun combos. You can paralyze and counter hit your enemy. They will then have like a double over and they will be like covered in the yellow zigzags uh, falling to the ground and then you will get a guaranteed combo, guaranteed follow up that will do quite good damage. But you can't just spam the same move. It has to be, you have to change it up as it says. And then you can follow it up when they're on the ground. So I do a, a combo with Killick whereby I hit them away from me and then poke them for extra couple of hits on the ground. Um, that's, an, that's a small example of that. Or Sophitia, where she will uh, take their legs out with a sweeping kick, and then she gets ground steps. Using the ring. Control the ring to control the match. Each stage in this game is referred to as a ring, being similar... Uh, being familiar with the shape of each ring and understanding your position with them is of the utmost importance for winning matches. You'll quickly find as you fight that one of the most essential skills is being able to take and retain advant advantageous positions using careful and precise eight-way runs. When it comes to positioning, broadly speaking, there are two things to keep in mind. The first is how to drive your opponent to the edge, while the second naturally is how to not have the same done to you. Cliffs and walls. The outer edges of a ring can consist of a number of different things, but among the most common and important are cliffs. If you can force an opponent off the edge of a cliff, you'll automatically win the round with a ring out, regardless of how much life either of you have remaining. Conversely, if the opponent's back is up against a wall, pushing them into it won't resu result in a ring out, but it will render them defenseless and allow you to hit them with a wall combo. Both of these options are powerful in their own right, and using them well can lead to victory. Fighting styles and positioning. Different fighting styles have different attacks and uh, that can push enemy fighters left, right, or backwards. Used wisely, these attacks and the ways in which they manipulate the positions of you and your opponent can quickly change the course of battle and even result in ringouts. By taking the time to learn each style and how they interact with one another in combat, you can broaden your overall knowledge about positioning and better maintain control of a fight. So. As again, that's about positioning and knowing your arena, knowing the ring, and knowing your character and which, maybe which horizontal moves you've got that ring out. Maybe you might have a, gr a throw that throws the enemy over your shoulder or pushes them away and pushes them into something, you know, pushes them out of the ring. Um, some characters have throws like that. And also, yeah, against cliffs and walls, you can wall splat and do a wall combo a bit like a stun combo, similar to... You can even then, if they get up and press, counter hit them for another stun and actually get them for another combo. But I'll show you that in a more advanced like section. Ukemi. How to perform a Ukemi. Okay. When you get sent flying by an enemy attack, you can use directions and guard as soon as you hit the ground to immediately recover with what's known as a Ukemi. There are multiple types of Ukemi that you can perform, but oftentimes the best one to do is a horizontal Ukemi which is able to easily avoid downward follow-up attacks. If you find this difficult to do, instead of direction, you can press and hold either uh, down or up and repeatedly press guard as well. Note, there are some situations where it's impossible to perform a Ukemi, which would be in a situation where you've been spiked and you're unable to roll or tech roll or Ukemi or air controlled because of that property of that move. Number two, Ukemi orientations and effects. The direction of a Ukemi changes its defensive properties. A forward Ukemi, forward and guard, can't be used to avoid downward follow-ups, but it does let you act quickly after you get up. In contrast, a horizontal Ukemi, uh, down or up and guard, can evade downward follow-up attacks with ease, but leaves you somewhat open to attack. Meanwhile, a back Ukemi, back and guard, can avoid short-range follow-up attacks and help create distance between you and your opponent. Being unpredictable. Getting knocked back by an attack is dangerous regardless of how you choose to react. As a result, it's unwise to always recover with the same Ukemi, or even use a Ukemi at all. If your opponent notices you're reacting to their attacks with consistent patterns, they'll be able to take advantage of them to damage you. Also, you'll be left defenseless for a moment after executing a Ukemi, leaving you at risk of getting attacked again. Being flexible during combat and cleverly deciding when to use a Ukemi and in which direction will make you less predictable. 
So again, this is just going over your wake ups, how to get off the ground. Um, the fact that you can press a direction and guard as you're landing during your flight and you know all of those times you can try and react from air control and then as you're air controlling you'll land then you'll be still pressing a direction and guard to kind of you came and get up um, and be guarding while you stand up right so and as it says forward gets caught by downward attacks but it lets you get up quicker uh, horizontal ones which uh, uh, direction and guard they evade follow-ups because you've tech rolled them right but it leaves you open to attack again almost which is annoying a back you can where you avoid just short a attacks or whatever will give you maybe a chance for a whiff punish uh, and obviously don't keep doing the same thing because you flow chart and you get predictable right following on from that Intermediate 5, getting up. Being downed. Being downed refers to when your character has fallen onto the ground. This can occur in many ways, such as when you choose not to perform a Yukemi after being blown back by an enemy attack. Blown back, huh? Okay. Or after getting hit by an air combo. Your options are extremely limited when you're on the ground, so it's important to get back up and regain, regain your posture without panicking. Ways to stand up. While downed, you can press guard to do a standing guard as you get... Uh, get back on your feet. Alternatively, you can press down, hold down, and guard to get up while doing a crouching guard. You can also roll forwards and backwards by using forwards or backwards, uh, or roll horizontally by using down or up. Um, if you hold down a direction as you roll, you can roll up to three times in a row. Beyond that, you can also press an attack button while downed, which will let you attack from the ground as if you're crouching, like a while standing move. Now, if you're facing away from your opponent while on the ground when you choose to attack, you'll do back-facing attacks rather than forward-facing attacks. So you'll be doing back-turned while standings. Deciding how to get up. Once you're downed, it's, easily, it's easy to get attacked again. If you're not sure how to react, the best course of action is, simply to, is often to simply guard as you get back up. Horizontal rolls are also important to master as they can help you get away from walls and cliffs and back towards a safe position, improving your overall chances of survival. So my tip for that, as uh, I do a lot, is when I'm on the ground, I use horizontal rolls all the time. I'm always trying to roll out the way. Maybe I'm trying to avoid a ring out situation. So I'm trying to roll down here into a bit more safety. Then I'll get up and guard. And then I'll step, try and step guard or something. Um, so that comes with ring awareness and knowing how to get up. Um, but a lot of the time, yeah, use eight-way run to try and you know air control. And then use a horizontal roll when you're landing to move and then get up and guard. Uh, make sure you're guarding at the end of it though at the end of your horizontal roll still guard as you stand and you'll be able to block okay advanced one counter hits have you ever noticed that when you hit an enemy with an attack sometimes they'll fall over a little differently than usual that's because the way you hit them uh, sorry the way you hit an enemy changes how much damage you deal and what sort of effects you inflict on them these hits with altered properties are referred to as counter hits once you understand how they work, you'll be able to deal more damage faster over the course of the match. The main types of counter hits. There are two main types of counter hits that you'll enco uh, encounter during a match. Attack counters and run counters. Attack counters are triggered when you manage to hit an enemy as they're attacking or before their attack is fully released. Uh, these counters will increase the damage of your attacks depending on the move you use attack counters can also make enemy fighters lose their balance more than usual and be used to begin a combo run counters on the other hand are triggered when you hit an enemy with a horizontal attack um, so an a attack as they're moving around the ring with eight way run directions they also occur when you hit an opponent with an attack horizontal or vertical as they're moving in the down back back or up back directions Run counters aren't triggered when the enemy is moving in the forward direction. Okay. Consistently triggering run counters relies on your ability to predict your opponent's movements and react accordingly with an attack that will stop them in their tracks. Impact counters are a special type of counter hit that are triggered when you land an attack on an opponent that can't be cancelled by a guard impact or reversal edge. Break attacks are often best used in a match in order to trigger an impact counter. So yeah, this is about counter hits. If you interrupt your enemy, if they're doing a you know 15 frame move and you do a 12 and you cut them off, boom, you get a counter hit, just like in Tekken. Um, 
And it's the other thing to remember is the, as it mentions, run counters. So you catch someone with a horizontal while they're eight way running, uh, which is catching them stepping, right? That's run countering them. You've stopped them in their tracks. They can't run any longer because you hit them and cut them from running. Uh, so that's what a run counter is, but not when they're moving towards you. I didn't know that before, but only when they're moving in a backwards direction can you cl uh, classify them as getting a run counter with horizontal and vertical. So if they're moving backwards, you can use either to counter them. If they're running, if they're eight-way running sideways uh, and, and direction horizontally, then you have to use a horizontal attack to track them. Uh, and impact counters are, yeah, as it says, an attack on an opponent that can't be cancelled by guard impact or reversal edge. Confirming hits. Uh, checking attack hit confirmations. Some moves can only start combos if they're used as a counter hit. When you want to use one of these to begin a combo, be sure to check that a counter hit has indeed taken place. Then input the rest of your combo. You can tell when a counter hit has taken place at a glance based on the color of the sparks that fly when one of your attacks lands. A normal hit will cause yellow sparks to appear, but a counter hit will be signified by a mixture of red and blue sparks. It takes practice to notice spark colors in the middle of a fight, but eventually you'll be able to recognize each hit type without losing focus. Mastering hit confirmations. Beyond counter hit confirmations, it's also important to be able to quickly distinguish when an attack has successfully connected and when your opponent has blocked it. When you know your attack has hit, that's your cue to maintain the offensive and pursue them for more damage. But when you know they've blocked an attack, it might be time to change course and assume a defensive position to prepare for a counter-attack. Mastering the timing and visual cues for these sequences will go far in making you a stronger fighter. Making the most of training mode. Being able to read hit confirmations in the middle of battle is an advanced skill that can be difficult to practice during live matches. The best way to get started is by practicing in training mode, which allows you to stage the fights under various conditions to hone your skills. For practicing hit confirmations, it's recommended that you set the dummy opponent to guard all random. If you want to take it one step further, you can also set the dummy's counter settings to random so that you can practice counter hit confirmations as well. So what this means is, yeah, being able to tell in the space of that second whether you, when you got the counter hit, being able to react to perform your combo. It's something, again, that experienced players will do naturally, especially if you play Tekken or you play Soul Calibur anyway. You'll already know, bam, that's a counter hit, but, 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 going into your combo. But that's something that you use training mode to help practice, to get used to that stun and the zigzags, maybe for the stun combos. You have to get used to seeing the yellow zigzags too, right? Uh, and obviously to use training mode in the right way to practice hit confirmations guard all random so that it's random when they block and you will have to confirm uh, and the counter settings to random so that you can practice the same thing for a counter hit combo so like when you do get a counter hit you have to react and you'll know because it's random yeah so that's quite cool let me just have a bit of coffee before we carry on I'm sorry this is so long but I wanted to go through it because I think it'd be very useful for people who are just learning the game and might not have even come across this menu yet. So I saw it and Tekken doesn't display things very easily and very intuitively and doesn't have any re like detailed info like this. So I thought I'd help with, even though this game has it, at least, you know, I could help bring some more awareness to the, this information for people to learn. So the next part is advanced 2.1 timing. Simultaneously attack, simultaneous attack priority. Each move has its own specific timing uh, that dictates how long it takes to hit an enemy and deal damage. Fast hitting attacks usually deal less damage, while high damage attacks are slow and take longer to perform. Because of this, if two players execute the move or a move at the same time, the faster attack will win and connect with the opponent fighter first. Uh, with the other fighter first, sorry. The one on the receiving end, meanwhile, will flinch and have their attack cancelled. Beating opponents to the punch. It may be somewhat uncommon, but fighters do launch attacks uh, at exactly the same time during a match. When this happens, whoever is hit first will falter at the blow. Oh my god, my nose. So itchy. And it will take time for them to recover and make their next move. This opens up for further opportunities to attack, even with uh, comparatively slow techniques. The end result is that you'll have more breathing room to fight how you want and can con uh, control the flow and tempo of a round if you hit your opponent first. 
successfully guarding. In most cases, when an attack connects, the attacker is able to move again faster than the fighter on the receiving end. However, when one attack, uh, when one fighter successfully blocks another's attack, the blocking character usually recovers more quickly. When facing an especially aggressive opponent, it can be to your advantage to uh, stand your ground and calmly block their attacks, then strike back with a quick move of your own. Uh, think of action prioritization in terms of, make, of taking turns. When one of your attacks hits, it's your turn to keep fighting. When one of your attacks is blocked, it's your opponent's turn to fight back. However, note that there are exceptions to these rules, in particular for break attacks. The attacking player will still be able to move first, even if the defending player tries to block. So I'm going to break that down in a sec. I'm just going to need to close this. Yeah, my throat's really bad. I'm sorry, because I'm reading so much. I'm like, ah, so dry. So, yeah, to break this down. Um, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, sometimes when you use it, if you both use an A attack, it will clash and hit at the same time. If you're using an A and they're using a B, your A is faster. It will beat the B. Um, so beat them to the punch. If you know they're favoring really heavy, slow attacks, you can get them for that. Um, successfully guarding as well is... <laughs> When you block an attack, like it says, blocking character usually recovers more quickly. But the, then that is dependent on the frames of that move uh, and if they're using break attacks, as it says. But yeah, the most important thing to remember is to just like be wary of what you're using and what your opponent's using and try and keep in my opinion keep note of if they're favoring big heavy attacks so you can like work on your timing and get quicker attacks in uh, and avoid clashing with the same attack and be able to maybe whiff punish them for it distance controlling time and space in close combat quick moves will hit the target faster than slower ones and make the enemy stagger because of this speed plays a crucial role in attaining victory but realistically speaking, rarely is an entire match spent solely in close quarters. Try as you might. Faster but shorter attacks can and will still lose to slower, longer range attacks if they aren't close enough to close the gap and connect with the opposing fighter. Uh, be mindful of distance. True mastery of your character's moves require grasping not only of how long they take to execute, but also their reach. It's important to consider which of your attacks can connect with your opponent at various distances and vice versa. Once you understand how much you reach you and your opponent's attacks have, you can make better judgment calls about how to approach your enemy at different distances. Distance and the ring. Each fighting star has its own ideal distance to an opponent. Those that are better suited for long range combat, for example, work best when fighting from a distance, winning matches with a barrage of one sided attacks from afar. Compare that with the fighting styles that are tailored for close range combat, which focus on maintaining just enough space for enemy feints to fight, uh, fail, then closing in for the kill after an attack misses. However you, choose to fight being, however you choose to fight, being constantly mindful of the distance between you and your opponent will enable you to take advantage of your fighting style strengths and dominate matches. It's also a good idea to get in the habit of keeping an eye on where you and your opponent are relative to any walls and edges. We already mentioned that earlier. If you find your opponent backed up against a wall, don't let them get away and create distance. Walls allow you to attack without needing to worry about potentially missing your opponent as much as you would in open space. So again, it's just knowing and learning your distance of your move, your character, you know, your fighting style, as well as distance between your walls, your rings, your, uh, sort of everything all at once. It sounds like a lot, but it's something that you will naturally be doing while you're playing, and you're going to be mindful of roll away from the edge, don't get wall splat, and it will all come in time. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much all I guess I can say on that. <clears throat> Clo uh, Advance 3.1, Close Fighters. Scoring counter hits. When you find yourself able to make the first move in close quarters combat, you should prioritize attacks that can score counter hits and start combos. Situations where you can attack first are often ideal for executing attack and run counters in particular. Play close attention to the combat lessons and character move lists. And eventually you'll learn which attacks deal high amounts of damage uh, as counter hits. Ah, cold coffee, brilliant. Guard breaking. Any opponent worth their salt is going to be wary of counter hits and will likely make liberal use of guarding to avoid taking damage. 
This can be troublesome, but the best way to counter a defensive fighter is to use a break attack to break through their guard with a combination of mid and low attacks. Given that your mid attacks generally deal more damage than lows, uh, it's likely that your opponent will be on the lookout for them. It can be effective to use lots of low attacks and throws to make your opponent resort to crouching guards when you attack, and then hit them with a strong mid. Maintaining offensive momentum. It goes without saying, but once you find the opportunity to attack in close quarters combat, it's best to find ways to attack an opponent for as long as possible. For instance, if you have a combo that's executed by pressing AAA, don't always finish it. Your opponent will learn to expect it. Instead, think about disrupting the combo and ending it early by pressing AA. While your opponent is still guarding in expectation of the third strike, you can catch them by surprise by mixing it up with another move, such as a throw for a potentially easy hit. Naturally, the principle works in reverse. If your opponent expects you to only swing twice in the above combo, the third attack could catch them off guard and land as a counter hit. In this, matter, uh, in this manner, varying when you interrupt a series of attacks and when you complete them can provide you with opportunities to maximize the time you have to attack the enemy. So... With that, obviously, guard breaking. If yeah, if they're if they're guarding a lot, learn your break attacks. Um, you can mess them up with break attacks, and it will like obviously go through their able to go through their guard. Um, and maintaining offensive momentum, using combos and things like that is this is kind of fighting game 101 and mind games as well. It goes back to that earlier point of mind games of. They expect AAA, so if you're just doing AA and perhaps sidestep, which is what I like to do, AA step, then you, when you do finish the third A, you will get count. They will get counter hit for it because they kept thinking you're not going to finish it. And when you do, you've caught them off guard. You get a counter hit, right? So it, yeah, it's a it's a great way to set things up and set mind games up in a, in a match. Um, but obviously, yeah, that's what, as it says there, in that manner, varying when you use the attacks and how you, if you finish them, and if you don't, will he or won't he finish the string? That's the the sort of main thing. So we're some of the most of the way through. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, so distance fighters, foiling attacks with reversal edges. When facing a fighter who can attack faster than you, attempting to trade blows with them up close is not the best idea. Doing so is likely to result in lethal counter hits. One option you have at your disposal instead is to use a reversal edge to stave off any high, mid or low attacks from your opponent and counter one with one of your own. From guarding to counter attacking. In many instances, blocking, is a high da uh, blocking a high damage combo starter will create a major opening for you to hit back. Stay calm and guard against wide, lumbering attacks, then move in with a quick counter of your own. Such tactics aren't without their weaknesses though. If your enemy lashes out with what turns out to be a two or three stage combo, they might be able to disrupt your counter attack and damage you. Additionally, you can't guard forever. If you find yourself low on guard stamina, the danger of your opponent crushing your guard in the midst of their attacks becomes much greater. There are, ways, uh, there are other ways to avoid an opposing fighter's attacks and create opportunities to hit back beyond just reverse ledges and guarding. For example, crouching guards will make high attacks and throws miss. You can uh, then use the opening created to start a combo of your own. Similarly, given that many mid attacks are vertical, you can step out of the way and 8 way run and respond in kind with a damaging combo. Responsiveness and adaptability are key when it comes to defense. Pay attention to how your opponent attacks and use crouches and 8 way runs to open up offensive opportunities. Of course, it's worth remembering that if timed well, repelling an attack outright with a guard impact is an excellent idea. So yeah, as that says, with long-range fighters, um, there's well, there's many things to sort of to go through here. You can beat distance fighters with the reversal edges, as it says. However, we've already gone over there are ways to counter reversal edge characters too, um, from guarding to counter attacking. Yeah, they, you can't guard forever, so if you are low on stamina, then they will mess you up with guard crushes and with um, lethal hits, which will break your armor as well. So you can't just turtle up and continually guard. Um, that's why you have to sometimes try and interrupt them for a counter hit, um, which is what it mentions as well. And then also, as it says, like crouching crouching guard to make highs whiff and to duck throws at the same time you're getting rid of two options just by ducking so if you know they're going for highs and throws a lot just just 
duck and maybe punish them for it. Uh, same as with stepping out of the way. If they're always doing verticals, then you can step out of the way of eight-way run and launch them with a combo, right? But it's just then it says about responsiveness and adaptability. That's just uh, paying attention and playing the game longer. The more you've played it, then the more you will be able to have that grasp of responding to a whiff and stepping. Control at mid-range. When a match starts, you and your opponent will be standing apart, depending on what fighting style you're using. You might not have any attacks that can hit from that far. This distance, where each fighting style strengths and weaknesses are most evident, is what's referred to as mid-range, whereas the biggest deciding factor in close-range fighting is the timing and speed of moves. At mid-range, greater emphasis is placed on controlling distancing. For fighting styles that focus on long-range attacks, the goal at mid-range is to lay down a series of one-sided attacks and maintain your distance. Conversely, for fighting styles with less reach, the goal is to slip past the opponent's attacks and engage them at close range. Where whichever side of the spectrum your personal style falls under, it's important to know the range that both you and your opponent excel at. Controlling the ring. When using a fighting style that works best from afar, it's possible to defeat an opponent with less reach before they can even get near you. To accomplish such a feat, you need to maintain a steady stream of damage while keeping them at arm's length. Attacks that have reach, speed, and a quick recovery are ideal for doing just that. Smart application of these moves will prevent the other fighter from getting close and let you maintain control of the fight. Uh, enhancing control. Achieving control of a fight is fundamentally about knowing which moves can exert control at which distance. If you can make these attacks graze your opponent at the very edge of your reach, you'll likely catch them by surprise and damage them, as they won't expect the range of your attacks to extend so far. It's a good idea to practice with each of your moves so that you can intuitively learn just how far their threat range is. So yeah, again, controlling mid-range, this is about obviously the when a match starts and you guys are that set distance from each other you're not long range you're not close range you're mid range some of your moves depending on your character will hit and some will miss so Killick is great at mid range Talim not so much because she needs to be really close quarters and if you know this you can as it says control the fight by being able to uh, keep them at arm's length. If you're using Nightmare or Siegfried, you're keeping them way at the edge of your sword, and I'm going to stay over here, and I'm going to whiff punish you, and I'm just going to keep attacking where you can't get me. And that's what, you know, you need to learn how to be able to get around him and, and get in to to mess him up if you're using Talim, for example, close range. Uh, and yeah, if you can even just skim them with the edge of your attacks, it, it, like hitboxes are hitboxes in these games, you know what it's like. So you will skim them, and then by that, you and your opponent may not be fully aware of the range of that move in particular anyway. So it, it's, it's a learning process for both of you and you will, as it says, be able to practice each of the moves and learn where that range is. So I know that if I'm this far away from Sophie, I can always get over this low. You know, that that's the kind of thing. And it's just learning that intuitively once you've played and practiced kind of thing. Okay, so countering at mid-range. Breaking control. For fighters that employ a close range style, one of the biggest struggles they'll face is how to combat an enemy who controls the ring with long range attacks. I've kind of just said this. Oops. Closing distance without getting hit requires knowing when to advance and when to guard. As you approach an enemy, quickly stop and block when you see them attack. If you succeed, you'll be able to act first and you can use the opening to get a little closer. Rinse and repeat until you're close enough to strike. Having said that, this strategy isn't without risks. If you mistime a block, you'll get hit and take damage, which will make you uh, will make staging a comeback that much harder. Using missed attacks to break control. Even if you manage to slowly block and guard your way close to your opponent, you'll still need to break through their defenses and hit them to win. This can be tough, but there's another option. The best way to quickly break uh, a long-ranged opponent's control and turn the tide is to make them miss an attack, then strike before they can recover. When timed well, it can enable you to pull off a powerful uh, to pull off powerful combos that can end the round in one fell swoop. Taking advantage of misses. In order to exploit a fighter's missed attacks to regain control, it's imperative to learn the reach of their moves. Once you do so, uh, you need to stand at the edge of their attack's range. When you see a strike coming, move to the side or backwards to avoid it. If you manage to dodge, there's no time to waste. Immediately input a retaliatory attack before your opponent recovers. Timing is critical. Uh, don't wait until you see that your opponent has missed before entering the command. Rather, do so as soon as you see an attack has been executed. 
so yeah here it's on about obviously countering at mid uh, and being able to get in against those long range opponents so advancing and blocking as it mentioned uh, when to advance when to block that's hard that's something you would learn intuitively and making them whiff and, and whiff punishing them before they can recover um, that is the main emphasis here uh, and to try and already be locked and loaded with the whiff punish as soon as they're even trying the move you're already stepping and punishing that's what it's trying to tell you countering opponents waiting for a miss the amount of damage that can be done to you from a combo that arises from a missed attack outweighs the damage that you can do from a single move meant to exert control as such experienced fighters will often not unleash any moves at all as they try to bait the other side into missing an attack Close range fighters can excel during these matches by using the standoff as an opportunity to quickly approach their opponent and possibly even finish them right then and there. <clears throat> Getting past an opponent's guard. Once you're, cl uh, once you're close to the enemy fighter, it's recommended that you start employing throws and lows in order to break their standing guard. This is because in many cases, when an opponent sees you running at them, they're likely to put up their guard in, uh, out of instinct. If, however, they try to use a technique to stop your advance, you can use the command forward forward, like forward and hold forward, which is an eight-way run forward, to break through it. Alternatively, you can also switch to the normal strategies for dodging such attacks uh, in an attempt to make your opponent miss as well. The three-way triangle of mid-range combat. When broken down to its essential components, there are three things that compromise uh, that comp comprise even that comprise mid-range combat. Control tactics, tactics for making your opponent miss, and getting close and breaking your opponent's guard. Each one is strong against one and weak to another. When an opponent is controlling the space and won't let you close, focus on trying to make them miss an attack so that you can safely approach them. If you see the opponent is trying to get you to miss an attack, abandon control moves and shift your priority to getting close and breaking their guard. And if your opponent is trying to get close to you, that's when you dish out the control moves and maintain space between the two of you. Once you've mastered the ability to read these situations and can act accordingly in the heat of battle, you'll be well on your way to becoming an advanced player. So yeah, it's breaking attacks at mid-range. Uh, it's quite a hard concept sometimes to understand. But countering opponents, when people, some good players like higher ranked and, and experienced players will wait for you to whiff and they'll just backdash and they'll block and they'll step block. They'll wait for you to whiff something and then mess you up for it. Um, close range fighters can kind of get in there and ruin those chances sometimes. Um, yeah, lows and throws to break standing guards and condition your opponent as well. And eight way run moves as well to break through. Uh, if they're trying, you know, like it says, if trying to use a technique to stop the advance, you can use forward forward to break through it. That's such a good use. And then the control tactics. Uh, making your opponent miss, getting close, and breaking the opponent's guard. Um, that's, again, things that will come more intuitively the longer you play the game and the more the experience that you have playing Soul Calibur. Uh, and again, it's to do with ring knowledge, spatial awareness, map awareness, everything. Hence why it says when you can actually do this in the heat of battle, you're on your way to become an advanced player. Very true, because trying to calculate all that in a split second and move around and do your inputs and think two moves ahead is not easily done <clears throat> no, no drink. although guarding oh guarding limitations sorry crushing an opponent's guard guarding limitations although guarding will save you from losing life to an opponent's attack it also drains your limited supply of guard stamina once your remaining guard stamina runs low, your health gauge will begin to glow. It will glow red, in actual fact, around your health bar. <clears throat> oh. Initially, it will glow yellow, but if you continue to guard, it will glow red and aggressively flash. If you persist and continue to guard, your guard will be crushed, leaving you wide open to an attack from your opponent. You should therefore be careful to limit the amount of attacks you need to directly guard against, while at the same time making your opponent continuously guard against your attacks to drain their guard stamina. Uh, it's also worth noting that things like guard impacts and reversal edge also consume a small amount of guard stamina when used. I didn't actually know that, so that's handy to know. Properties. When you attack an enemy whose guard has been crushed, the hit will have the same effects as a typical attack counter, like a counter hit or a stun combo. As a result, uh, moves that you can use to start combos only when they act as counter, hit, counter hits can also be used to start combos against fighters when their guard's crushed. 
However, small quick attacks that deal little damage will not crush an opponent's guard, even if your opponent only has a small amount of guard stamina remaining. Likewise, uh, while big attacks with long execution times can be used to crush their guard, the slow recovery time makes it difficult to successfully follow up with additional attacks afterwards. Guard crushing tips and counters. Uh, one of the primary ways to crush an opponent's guard is to make them defend against big attacks, since lumbering heavy moves that deal more damage reduce guard stamina more than weaker attacks. On the other hand, if you find yourself confronted with a fighter who is intent on crushing your guard, you can stop them with 8-way run to dodge their attacks, or the reversal edge to counter them. Using a soul edge or interrupting their attacks with a, f a faster one of your own are also viable strategies. Once, your fighter has had, well, once a fighter has had their guard crushed, their guard stamina will fully recover. Because each fighter's guard stamina amounts are carried over between rounds, it can be strategic to avoid crushing a fighter's guard in one round so that you can more quickly do so in the next. So this is awesome to know about crushing their guard. Um, as it says, health gauge will glow when you're starting to crush, so it will be yellow and then red and flashing red when it's really about to break instantly on the next hit kind of thing. Um, small quick attacks deal little damage and won't crush the guard, and slow recovery time makes it difficult to successfully follow up with additional attacks. Yeah, so if you're using a really slow recovering move, then it's going to make it awkward for you to, to do a combo off of it because it's a slow powerful move. Um, that will come from knowing your character's moves again. You'll know what to use when. Um, bah, 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 bah. Each fight is guard stamina. Yeah, so about this with guard stamina. Once you break their guard stamina, they then are full again. But So it's worth knowing that if I, had you fla if I was fighting you and I had you flashing red, um, perhaps then I could carry that over, right, to the next round and then crush you at the start of the next round really easily. Uh, that's what that tells me. So that could be very useful. Lethal hits. This is a uh, good mechanic worth knowing about as well. Under specific circumstances, certain attacks will cause what's known as a lethal hit when they connect. When a lethal hit occurs, your opponent's movements will slow down, allowing you to perform even deadlier combos than usual. You also receive a bonus boost to your soul gauge. All told, the effects of a lethal hit can enable you to shift a fight greatly in your favour. Note. As a special effect, when a lethal hit occurs, your opponent's equipment will break, but this has no actual effect on their defense or other parameters. Lethal hit activation requirements. Lethal hits can only be triggered using moves within each fighting style that are specially designed for that purpose. Beyond that, specific requirements that are uh, unique to each move must be met with respect to how they hit the target in order for a lethal hit to be triggered. Sorry, I butchered that. Put simply, lethal hits are an advanced gameplay system designed for experienced players that require careful planning in order to pull off. None, uh, nevertheless, the harder a lethal hit is to perform for a given move, the greater the soul gauge bonus is when triggered, making them well worth your while to pursue when you're feeling ready for them. Finding opportunities for lethal hits. The first thing you need to do when trying to incorporate lethal hits into your combat routine is to determine which moves within your fighting style are capable of triggering them. To do that, consult the lethal hit tab within your fighting style's move list, where you'll learn the activation requirements for each move. Some moves are extremely difficult to use for lethal hits, though in such cases, it's better to focus on moves that you can comfortably use in your existing arsenal, rather than having to force yourself into incorporating a tricky move for lethal hits that you're unaccustomed to using. So yeah, lethal hits have certain conditions whereby they will grant the lethal hit. So Killick has back, uh, what number is it? Four, four and A, four A, or back and A, uh, where he does a low strike. He has to hit that low strike four times in a match to grant a lethal hit, right? Uh, we'll go through more of these when I actually play as some of the characters in a bit in the next part uh, of my stream and the video. Uh, I want to kind of explain those as they're happening in practice mode and show you how to trigger lethal hits. I will do that through the command list. Each character has their own lethal hits and different conditions to trigger them. So you need to just look through your character's move set and find what the lethal hits are. And it says along the bottom of the screen how to trigger them. You know, must uh, will become a lethal hit on the fourth hit, the fourth time that hits in a round. And with Killick as an example, he hits on the first hit, 
The second time he hits them, he says two. The third time, he says three. And the fourth time, he says something else. Uh, and that's when the lethal hit occurs. So you can tell audibly through Killick, perhaps maybe with other characters too, I haven't explored yet. But you can tell audibly with Killick, with that one move anyway. Uh, and the other moves obviously have different conditions depending on circumstance. You may have to... It's like they're like challenges. You have to do some wacky things in a match to even make that become a lethal hit. But when you break through the lethal hit, it gives you a massive counter hit combo. So it's very worth doing. Uh, it's definitely worth to learn them and like as it says, focus on easy, um, on easy lethal hit moves instead of really powerful ones that are awkward. Because if you can never get it in, what's the point? You're gonna want with one that you can use a lot. So Killix 4A is good. You use it all like 20 times around anyway. So you're always gonna land it. And then you like you just have to be wary of the fourth hit to then be ready to combo locked and loaded. Throws can be uh, throws and grapple breaks. Throws can be performed with any fighting style by pressing L2 or back and L2. Um, Throws are also, as it's not mentioned there, throws are also inputted by A plus G and back A plus G. Uh, throws are a powerful asset in your combat arsenal as they can't be blocked by standing guard. Once you input the command to throw your opponent, your character will perform a grab an animation. If it connects, they'll then proceed to throw your opponent and deal, a dam uh, deal damage to them. Generally speaking, throws performed by pressing uh, L2 will thrust your opponent forward while throws that are done by pressing back and L2 will shove them backwards, although this can vary depending on the fighting style. You can also perform crouching throws and mid-air throws, which as you might expect, are done against crouching and mid-air opponents respectively. Grapple breaks. Rest assured, not all hope is lost if your opponent manages to grab you. When that happens, you can input a specific command to perform a grapple break that will let your character break free. There are two types of grapple breaks, one for each type of grab. <clears throat> when your opponent comes at you with a uh, back and L2 throw, uh, you can then press back and any attack button, A, B or K, to grapple break. If they use a standing grab, a normal uh, raw standing L2 grab, you can grapple break by pressing an attack button without pressing a direction. Be warned, not all throws can be grapple broken. If you see a flame effect appear when your opponent grabs your character, that means the throw cannot be escaped. On the flip side, there are also rare throws that can be grapple broken in the middle of the throw. Using guard break, uh, guarding and grapple breaks together. When you find yourself on the defensive, you can uh, safely press and hold guard while in a standing guard. Then press one of the attack buttons when an opponent grabs you in order to grapple break. So you're holding guard, and then as soon as they grab you, you're ready on, a, on an attack to instantly press it at the same time as guard, and you're already breaking. Uh, this can potentially lead to bad habits in terms of how you control your character, but it's the safest defensive technique to perform during a battle, which makes it highly useful in real matches. Finally, if you find it hard, uh, find it hard to time your button presses correctly when attempting to perform a grapple break, you can press and hold G, guard, while repeatedly pressing an attack button and hope for the best. So that's actually telling you to hold guard and mash an attack button to try and get out of the throws. But in Soul Calibur, as opposed to Tekken, um, in, in Tekken, throws are designated with particular breaks, one, two, and one plus two, right? Left hand, right hand, and both hand breaks. In this game, you cannot visually tell, and I think it's done with the same hand. So it is a true 50-50 mix up with throws. Um, it's, you wouldn't, I don't think you'll be able to see it in battle. I think you'll have to wing it and guess, to be honest. Break attacks. Powerful attacks capable of breaking an opponent's guard are signified with blue lightning that appears when executed. Generally speaking, they can be performed by pressing L1 or uh, by holding A plus B. Although each fighting style has multiple other attacks capable of breaking an opponent's guard as well, critically, these attacks have the ability to break through reversal edge and guard impacts. They also allow you to act first after an opponent blocks them. Using break attacks. Break attacks are slow to execute. Without careful strategic planning, your opponent can easily dodge them or counter them with quick attacks. As a result, it's best to use them with discretion and wait for your opponent to trigger a reversal edge or a guard impact before executing a break attack. This makes break attacks ideal after you've hit your opponent already 
uh, when their instincts will likely tell them to assume a defensive position. Again, uh, the fact that you can move again first, even after a break attack is blocked, is another good reason to wait until your opponent is acting defensively before using them. Once you've made your opponent block, uh, uh, sorry, opponent block your break attack, you can then do a short combo like AA or BB to follow up with some quick hits. Special break attack properties. Once you've blocked a break attack, you'll be temporarily unable to block. When that happens with certain break, uh, sorry, when that happens with certain break attack techniques, there are instances where your opponent's next attacks are guaranteed to hit. In very rare cases, there are attack strings that can take advantage of this property to deal massive damage when the conditions are just right. So yeah, blue lightning break attacks are done by L1 or by pressing A plus B. They are blue lightning attacks which will guard break uh, and they get through reversal edges. So as we mentioned at the reversal edge part, if people are spamming reversal edge on you, you can use break attacks to like thwart their plans, basically. If your opponent blocks a break attack, you're stupidly plus on block and you can move and act first. So you can use a break attack and then an AA and you might be able to, to trap them and get frame traps in. Um, some instances where it's they get guaranteed after a break attack, that will probably depend on the character and the particular move, I would imagine, looking at how that's presented and how that's written. Nearly there, guys. Nearly there. Nearly there. I'm going to try and blitz through this. Some of this shit isn't too long, I think. Guard impacts. Guard impacts are also referred to as a GI. So you'll hear people say about GI in Soul Calibur. This is what they're referring to. It's a guard impact. Are performed by pressing forward and guard and are used to repel an opponent's attack and break their posture. When successful, they provide openings that can be used to unleash a combo. However, guard impacts require precise timing as they can only repel an enemy's attack at the very beginning of the animation. For newer players, it's suggested that you focus on mastering reversal edges first, then slowly incorporate guard impacts into your fighting routine. This will likely make the learning process go faster and more smoothly overall. Guard impacts versus reversal edges. One major trait that differentiates guard impacts from reversal edge is their ability to outright cancel an opponent's actions. This gives them the edge over reversal edges. Uh, hang on. This gives them an edge over reversal edges against attack chains that might otherwise be difficult to handle. Guard impacts make for a swift defensive response and are ideal for interrupting a potentially prolonged series of attacks. But like the reversal edges, guard impacts can't break, uh, can't block break attacks or unblockable attacks, and are therefore not invincible against every attack that you might face. What you do after a guard impact. After you've performed a guard impact, you might be tempted to use the most damaging attack you have, but before you react, it's important to consider how and sorry, yeah, how and to what extent your guard impact has broken your opponent's posture. It varies depending on the strength of the attack being reflected. Weak attacks that are repelled with a guard impact will greatly disrupt your opponent's posture, while stronger, heavier attacks that are repelled will impact their posture to a much lesser degree. In total, there are three different states that an enemy fighter can be in after taking a guard impact, which are outlined as follows. When a weak attack is repelled, the enemy is exposed long enough for you to initiate a combo. When a medium attack is re repelled, the enemy is exposed long enough for you to hit them with a quick attack. When a large attack is repelled, you'll be able to move again first, but won't be able to attack them quickly before they can recover. It's important to bear all of these potential states in mind when fighting so that you can properly plan for your next move upon successfully executing a guard impact. So yeah, guard impact is a universal uh, trait in Soul Calibur, GI, forward and guard at the same time. At the time of the move, you'll have a green kind of pa uh, parry spark. It will reflect the enemy away. Uh, it takes really precise timing. You can't just hold it like you would a reversal edge. Uh, so that's why it says to learn reversal edge first, because you will get to learn the enemy's attacks and what you're parrying. And then eventually when you know it's high, high, mid, you'll go block, block, GI. And then once you get a GI, don't use your strongest, you know, strongest move straight after a GI because of what it outlines further below, which is a little bit confusing. But so if they if a weak attack is GI'd, you can get a combo. If it's a medium attack, you're they're long enough for you to get one quick attack. That that's the enemy's exposed long enough after your GI to get one quick attack. But if it's a large attack that was GI'd, then you'll be able to move first, but won't be able to attack quickly enough before they can recover anyway so yeah 
it'd be one of them things again as i've said quite a lot of these chapters about uh experience in the game and experience with these situations and like learning how to react uh how to react on reaction once you gi you gi somebody's attack you'll have to know and be able to react a bit like a counter hit combo as to whether they are massively put off off point or whether you've only just they've only repelled a little bit because then that will be the difference between what your follow-up is so if they're turned right around baby right round like a record then you know that you're getting a combo on it you know from your weak attack they've turned right like reflected right out of the way you're gonna get them right Guard impacts supplemental info. Responding to guard impacts with reversal impacts. When first learning about guard impacts, it might seem when an opponent hits you with one, all you can do is stand idly by as they follow through with an attack. Although guard impacts leave you open, you're not entirely defenseless. That's where reverse impacts come into play. Reverse impacts are performed just like guard impacts by pressing forward and guard, but after you've been guard impacted and are able, unable to move. With the right timing, a reversal impact can help turn the tables back on your opponent after having the tables turned on yourself. Oh, too far. Another option that you have available after being GI'd and guard impacted is to use a reversal edge by pressing R1. This is useful in situations where your opponent tries to follow up a guard impact with a large attack. Such attacks can still be repelled uh, with a reverse impact, but you have little to gain from doing so. In comparison, if you choose to respond uh, to a large follow-up attack with a reversal edge, you'll get a wide enough opening to be able to strike back at your opponent. Watching out for reversal impacts. As should be clear by now, even once you've been guard impacted, the enemy's fighter is likely to be aware of the possibility you'll try to counter their next move with a reverse impact. The same is obviously true in reverse. Even if you successfully execute a guard impact, you can't get complacent as your next attack may be reverse impacted. If you suspect, suspect that your opponent is going to attempt a reverse impact on you, go for a break attack instead. Or if you think your opponent is deliberately refraining from using a reverse impact or a reversal edge, that's when you can go in and initiate a combo. Recognizing which situation is about to take place will help you make the most of successful guard impacts to inflict as much damage to your opponent as possible. So again, this is you, yeah, going over the point of you can use, after you've been GI'd, you can reverse GI them. Uh, you can use a reversal edge after you've been GI'd, um, but not always a good option, uh, but can be. Um, because they might be baiting you. They might bait your reverse edge. And if, if that's the case, then they're going to be ready for it, right? So that's when, and as it says there, if your opponent is going to attempt a reverse edge, you go for a break attack instead. So, yeah. Uh, initiate combo. Recognizing each situation, that again will come from time. Move levels. In addition to raw damage output, every attack in the game has what's known as move levels, which denotes its strength when it clashes against other attacks. Broadly speaking, move levels classify an attack as either weak, medium, or strong. They also affect what happens when a vertical attack clashes with a horizontal attack. Vertical attacks are strong against horizontal attacks. When the two clash, the vertical attack's move level will be considered one level higher than normal. For instance, if a medium vertical attack clashes with a strong horizontal attack, its strength will be roughly at the equivalent of a strong horizontal attack when resulting, uh, resolving the clash. How simultaneous attack clashes are resolved. If two attacks happen to meet at exactly the same time, the clash will be resolved based on the difference in move levels for each attack, as described below. If the move levels for both attacks are equal when they clash, they'll bounce off one another and neither side will take damage. If the difference in move levels for each attack is small, the player with the weaker attack will have their move repelled and be open to a counter attack. If the dif difference in move levels for both attacks is great, the stronger attack will proceed as normal and hit the receiving player. Note, these rules don't apply to a non-weapon attack clashes, such as kicks, which are non-weapon attacks. In cases where two non-weapon attacks clash at the same time, both attacks will hit regardless of their respective move levels. So kicks will just trade. Move levels and guard impacts. Move levels also affect how a guard impact will be resolved as described below. Weak attacks will create a large opening when repelled, enabling the defending fighter to initiate a combo. Medium attacks that are repelled will knock the attacker slightly back, providing only enough time to execute a quick attack in retaliation. 
Strong attacks will not create a large enough opening upon being repelled to be counterattacked and are safe from follow-up attacks. So yeah, move levels are weak, strong, uh, weak, medium, and strong, uh, and the game works out its clashes depending on the strength of the move. So yeah, strong beats medium, and a vertical will get a buff of one extra level. Um, and also effects with guard impacts as well because of the way it's repelled as I've said so yeah it's uh it sounds like a lot but again it it will all come it will all become clear while you're playing you'll get used to it it's fine reversal edges supplemental info additional ways to trigger reversal edge clashes clashes that take place after a successful reversal edge are an important component of every fight in addition to the normal method of triggering them there are two other ways that can occur during a match one way is for a reversal edge to be guarded against after the input has been held down for the maximum amount of time. The other way is for one fighter's reversal edge, after interrupting their opponent's attack, to be guarded against. In both these cases, break attack properties are applied and the reversal, edges, the reversal edge can't be blocked by other reversal edges or guard impacts. Your only options available against them are to either evade with an 8-way run or try to block them as best you can. Reversal Edge Clash is round two. Under specific circumstances, Reversal Edge Clash can continue for a second round. This will occur either when both players choose the same attack button during the clash, or when one player chooses to attack with B and is blocked by the other player pressing guard. Uh, in the event that the second round occurs, even if both players choose the same attack, one side will always win. See below for more details. Additionally, if one player attempts to guard against a B attack, their guard will be crushed. In essence, no matter what happens, a definitive conclusion is always reached when a second clash occurs. Note, if a player with low guard stamina attempts to stand guard by pressing G in the first round of a clash, their guard may still be crushed by a B attack. Offense and, defense, offense and defense in reversal edge clashes. The fighter who successfully lands the reversal edge and initiates a clash is treated as the attacker. Because the attacker has already broken the defending fighter's posture, they have the following advantages, as outlined below. The rate at which the attacker gains soul gauge in order to trigger a critical edge is greatly increased. If the reversal edge clash enters a second round, all of the attacker's hits will be treated as lethal hits. If the reversal edge clash enters a second round and both players press the same attack button, the attacker will win the clash. So that just goes over more of the rock, paper, scissors element of um, the reverse ledge clash. Uh, and obviously, da -da -da -da, go right back up to the top here. Two other ways that they occur in a match. Uh, it can be guarded against after the full parry of a reverse ledge. Um, and after interrupting their opponent's attack to be guarded against. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Then in the second round, as it says, even if they're guarding, your uh, B attack can break their guard, and if they're low on guard stamina, will crush them, and then you can get a free combo from that. Um, the most important thing to remember, as far as I've seen looking at this, is a definitive conclusion is always reached when a second clash occurs. So even if they, with the attacker, if they both press the same button, the attacker wins. Um, yeah. The attacker's hits in the second round will be lethal hits. That means they will break the armor of the opponent. So if it go, if the reversal edge enters second round, then and I win the second round, that's lethal hit, and then I can get a super or I can get a combo. So a lot of the time, I try and do reversal edge. Uh, I try and win the clash and stun them, and then if I can win the clash and stun them, I can get a guaranteed critical, which is a super. That's how I like. That's one of my strategies that I run as Sophie. Soul Gauges. Uh, the Soul Gauge is the second most important battle UI element after the Health Gauge. Each player can build up to two gauges. Once they have at least one, they can choose to spend it on either a Critical Edge or Soul Charge. Soul Gauges are carried over to the next round, so use them uh, strategically. Also, if one fighter wins two consecutive rounds, the losing player will start the next fight with an additional Soul Gauge. Uh, there are multiple ways to gain and lose soul gauge the main instance which are described below foiling the opponent's attack with a reversal edge will add to the soul gauge additionally initiating a clash with reversal edge will give the initiating player a large boost to the amount of soul gauge that they receive taking the initiative by doing things such things as attacking and advancing on the opposing player will add to the soul gauge 
The higher an attack's move level, the more soul gauge the user will gain. Both inflicting and receiving damage will increase a player's soul gauge. When the final round begins, fighters will pump themselves up and gain one soul gauge. Successfully executing a guard impact will add to the player's soul gauge. Spending soul gauge. As mentioned before, above, each player can only gain a maximum of two soul gauges. Thus, while it's important to find ways to increase your soul gauge, it's also equally important to actively use your soul gauge. This is especially true of the additional soul gauge provided as a bonus during the final round of a match with everything on the line. It's important not to be stingy with your soul gauge, use it or lose it. Keeping one soul gauge in reserve. While it's important to be proactive about spending the soul gauges, it can be helpful to keep one in reserve to give yourself a trump card that can turn the tides of battle. This is because of when your character is low on health, damage that's dealt with a critical edge is greatly increased. Plus, when a soul charge is active, the battle timer stops, preventing the... Uh, a battle from ending by the time of running out. Of course, this isn't to say that there's never a good time to empty out your soul gauge and spend it all to go on the offensive. Weigh up your options wisely. So yeah, soul gauges, you can build them up uh, and it's down to you whether you want to use a critical edge or a soul charge from that. We've already gone over soul charge. Um, you can carry them over, that's useful. So you'll, if you get to two out of three rounds and you're winning against your opponent, you've got two gauges left. Just use them in the last round, you know, you might, or not just waste them, but like you might be able to st strategically use them in the last round to wipe your enemy out with two critical edges. It's worth doing. Um, and the fact that the losing player, if you, if one fighter wins two consecutive rounds, the losing player will get a boosted soul gauge in the next round. And everyone, you get one, yeah, you get it in the final round. That is so useful to know. Because you may be low on soul gauge and you're getting your ass handed to you and then, oh, cool, I'm in the last round, I'll get a free soul gauge. Knowing that, you can help plan ahead. Um, and yeah, because you know you're going to get another one, use them. Um, but also sometimes keep one in reserve to help you win a match if you need it, you know. We are almost there. Almost there, guys. I'm sorry. Aerial control. When you find yourself uh, on the receiving end of a combo starting attack, don't fret. You haven't lost yet. During an air combo, you can press a direction to activate what's called aerial control and influence the direction you'll fall. Used effectively, aerial control can help you minimize the amount of damage that you take from an enemy's combo and get out of dangerous situations. However, it's important to know that you cannot use aerial control if your character's body is spinning in the air at high speeds. Falling diagonally backwards, the best direction in which to move with aerial control. Oh, okay. The best direction in which to move with aerial control depends on the combo that your opponent is deploying, as well as combat situations uh, for the round in general. More often than not, the best way to avoid an aerial combo is to move diagonally backwards by pressing either down back or up back. This will shift you out of the axis of many of your opponent's vertical and short range attacks. However, be mindful of your surroundings when you're choosing a direction in which to fall. If you're near the edge of a ring, one wrong decision can mean the difference between landing safely on solid ground and plummeting to your death. Demise. Demise, not death. It said demise. My bad. Plummeting to your demise. I'm not going to put words in their mouth. If you're uh, aerial control near cliffs, if your opponent hits you with an aerial combo near a cliff, rather than move diagonally backwards and risk falling off, it's advised to use air control to move back towards the center of the stage by pressing down forward or up forward. While this carries the risk of taking a lot of damage from a powerful combo, there's still a better price to pay than an accidental ring out. So yeah, I mentioned this earlier, air control. When you're being comboed, hold a direction to move out of the way of a, an air combo, throw them off axis, and they should whiff, and you'll hopefully dodge out of it. And if they haven't done their lab homework, it won't be a legit combo, and you'll get out of it, and they'll be annoyed. They'll be thinking, what, that's supposed to be guaranteed. But if they haven't done their correct air control homework, they might be using combos that are not real combos. The offense and defense of downing. Downing an opponent. After a fighter has been knocked down, their options are limited and they're mostly unable to go on the offensive. This provides a superb opportunity to attack. Offensive moves that are designed to make the most of an opponent being downed are referred to as okazemi. It's imperative, therefore, to learn which moves in your fighting style are able to bring an opponent down, uh, with L2 throws being among the most obvious options. 
hitting an opponent while they're down. Once you have down, uh, once you have an enemy fighter on the ground, you'll want to transition to attacks designed to stop them from getting back up. For starters, it's often best to use a low or mid attack that can be executed quickly and hits downwards. Ideally, it should be a move that can break through their guard whenever they choose to stay down or try to get back up. Big moves that can normally be readily countered by your opponent with quick attacks are also effective when they're downed. In particular, break attack. Uh, break attacks that allow you to move first even when they're blocked are highly recommended. How to respond when attacked when getting back up. Once you're down on the ground taking Okazeme attacks from your opponent, it's hard but not impossible to get back up without taking further damage. The key is to make yourself as hard of a target as possible to hit. This means that in addition to guarding, you should also be incorporating horizontal and backward rolls to avoid getting hit. Also remember that even if you're hit while you're down, you can still respond by using a Ukemi. Sometimes it may even be ideal to stay down, get hit, and use a Ukemi to create distance between you and your enemy. That way you can safely stand back up. You'll take damage, but it can be a fair trade-off if it can help you avoid taking damage, even uh, avoid taking even heavier damage. You can also avoid being hit with a damaging attack uh, and getting knocked back down immediately after getting back up as well. So yeah, this talks about wake ups, uh, Okazumi, Okazemi, and um, knock like hitting an opponent when you're down. You wanna if they're down and you're not, you wanna follow up and get wake up attacks. Hit them when they're down, force them to get back up. Then they get back up into another set of attacks potentially because you've made them panic. But sometimes it's worth to stay down and take the hits because then you can roll out, uh, get better positioning afterwards, um, things like that. You might be able to. Um, You might be able to do things like, as it says there, break through their guard, whether they choose to stay down or get back up, especially if, depending on your move choice that you're using and the situation you're in. And if you're the opponent, if you're the uh, fighter that's down, then you might choose, as I said earlier, to take a few extra hits while down, therefore to avoid worse positioning afterwards you might want to take the hits roll out of the way try and get up and get a better position it, it's one of them things movement and how to respond again uh like how to once you're on the ground taking damage as it says it's hard but not impossible to get up you just have to sort of be cool play it calm and don't panic uh, sometimes the enemy is setting you up by hitting you multiple times to get you to stand up into their attack but it's one of them things. If you know the player and you know the strategy and the characters, then you'll be able to get used to that over time. I need a drink after this. Yeah, I know, right? Defensive properties. Moves with guard impact properties. In addition to the general guard impact that we can perform with every fighting style by pressing forward and guard, there are guard impact moves unique to specific styles as well. Some of them can even be simultaneously offensive and defensive, allowing you to repel an enemy attack and counterattack at the same time. While these moves certainly have their fair share of advantages, their drawback is that unlike normal guard impacts, forward and guard, the specific types of moves that they can repel are limited. For example, some moves with guard impact properties may only be able to repel a vertical attack, uh, vertical attacks, and among even among vertical attacks, they may not work against kicks and thrusts. While learning which moves have guard impact properties, be sure to consult the additional notes provided in the move list and see what sort of limitations are present. Note, some moves with guard impact properties can be reversal impacted by your opponent. Using revenge to take yeah, using revenge to take hits without flinching. Some powerful fighting styles have a property known as revenge that allows a fighter to take hits without having their move interrupted. When a fighter takes damage while revenge is in effect, their body will glow red and they continue to execute their intended attack. Revenge can be a powerful tool when used in capable hands as it can negate the threat of, an enemy, of enemy attempts at exerting control. However, revenge only applies to high and mid attacks. A revenge fighter will still flinch at a low attack. There are also some moves where revenge will only remain in effect up to a certain point uh, up to a certain damage threshold. If the damage taken in one attack exceeds that threshold, uh, then the fighter will flinch as normal. Uh, other defensive properties. Beyond guard impact and revenge, moves can have a variety of other beneficial defensive properties. Those include These include moments of invincibility that go into effect during specific timing windows. This applies to the majority of critical edges. 
There are also a number of techniques that provide invincibility only against certain attacks. For example, some work only against high attacks. This can stop some of the fastest attacks in the game, such as AA combos. Knowledge of these sorts of defensive properties will open up strategic options available to you. So yeah, this is a, again to break this down. Some moves have GI built in. Killick is a good example of this in his monument stance, which is QCF. He then has an auto GI, which he can repel uh, verticals, I believe. And then he can counter, because he gets the GI on them, he can then follow up with an attack. Um, the revenge is like guts, where they can still tank through it. Um, I'm not too sure on much more of revenge at this present time. This is day one of launch. So once I have more information of revenge and how it fully operates more than what that says there, then I will try and update this. Um, so as well, this last part some techniques have their own evasion effect so Voldo's A plus K his uh, super freak allows him to like dance his way out of a move and uh, avoid AAs by dodging it and taking no damage so only some characters have this how many more have we got how many more oh my god only a few only a few okay Making an opponent's attacks risky. Finding openings in enemy attacks. Although attacks are by nature designed to inflict damage, all of them come with an element of risk. After an attack is finished, it takes time to recover before you can move or guard again, which leaves you open to a counterattack. Thus, it's crucial to make it risky for your opponent to attack you, thereby limiting the number of viable options they have at any given time. Failure to do so will allow them to steamroll you with strong moves. Guarding first for a def guarding first for a definite counterattack. When you guard against an attack, your character will recoil momentar and momentarily stop before you can react again. When this window, when this window is shorter than the attacking player's recovery time, you have an opportunity to move again first and can land a sufficiently quick attack. These sorts of guaranteed hits are referred to as definite counterattacks. Definite counterattacks can be used to initiate combos and land slow, damaging techniques. They allow fighters to attack without needing to engage in conventional mind games and predict each other's actions, and are a major source of damage in matches between experienced players. Fighting styles that emphasize defense and uh, that, uh, sorry, fighting styles that emphasize defense have attacks that are well suited to definite counterattacks, as they possess quick techniques with high damage output. Get to know your fighting style's move set and learn to pull off definite counterattacks. And you'll be on your way to mastering the advanced systems that this game has to offer. And definite riposts. There are some attacks that won't be quick enough for a definite counterattack, however, that same attack can be successfully hit with an opponent if you dodge their attack first. This technique is known as a definite riposte. A definite riposte can be achieved in a number of riposte, I'm probably saying it wrong, Please bear with me. Correct me if I've said it wrong. Uh, a definite repost can be achieved in a number of different ways. For instance, if an opponent uses a long-range horizontal high or tries to grab you to break your guard, you can duck to dodge <laughs> and then hit back. Likewise, if an enemy swings at you with a vertical attack, you can slip out of the way with an eight-way run or a step, then safely retaliate when you're outside of the axis of their attack. Uh, there are also numerous instances where you'll be able to dodge an opponent's attack mid attack string mid combo. That's why it's important to not only study up on your fighting style, um, but those of your opponent. That way you'll know what sort of attack strings to expect and be able to plan accordingly. So this is, yeah, making, let's have a look, baiting them, using mind games, um, and making your enemy not want to use their attacks. Um, because then if you know your definite counterattacks, you can mess them up for it. It's again, it's just counter hit fishing, uh, and counter hit, uh, like, baiting them to try and fish for counter hits. Um, to mention my games, protecting your actions, I some damage, yeah. And the reposts or reposts, uh, or ripozettis, or however you pronounce that, uh, yeah. That is again, and as it says, there's sort of instances where you'll be able to uh, attack mid-combo. Um, and a definite repost, sorry, I skipped a bit. A definite repost can be achieved in a number of different ways, as it says. Long range, horizontal, high, you can duck to dodge and hit them back. So it's just a case of ducking and countering. Um, if you know that their, their high is going to whiff, then you can get a low poke, uh, things like that. And with the attacking mid combo, 
as it says at the bottom that is again to do with character knowledge learning your opponents like i know with sophie her i think it's back aaa the second hit is a low and it catches a lot of people off um so it's just knowing the strings knowing when to step when to block when to guard all that kind of usual jazz Chip damage. While soul charge is in effect, you can inflict chip damage, which is damage that's dealt to an opponent even when they're guarding your attacks. You can tell that they're damaging an opponent with chip damage uh, when they glow red, white. You can tell that they're damaging an opponent with chip damage when they glow red while guarding. Chip damage therefore rewards players who go on the offensive uh, while a soul charge is active by letting them damage defending players who insist on guarding. However. Chip damage cannot be used to knock out an opponent. You'll still have to finish them off the old-fashioned way, even with the soul charge activated. Note, some fighting styles have moves that can inflict chip damage even when the soul charge isn't activated. Avoiding chip damage. Chip damage is a nasty, dangerous thing to have to confront during a fight, but since it only affects you if you directly guard against attacks from your opponent with an active soul charge, as long as you use other defensive measures, you can still avoid taking any damage. Reverse ledges and guard impacts are two ways that you can effectively defend yourself against a soul charged opponent. Uh, employing perfect guard. None of this is to say that it's entirely impossible to avoid taking damage by blocking. If you press guard right before an enemy's attack is about to connect with you, you'll prefer perform a perfect guard that will cancel out any chip damage that you'd otherwise take. You'll know you've successfully executed a perfect guard if your character's body flashes white and your soul gauge slightly increases. Perfect guard is are extremely difficult to pull off reliably and shouldn't be used recklessly. Still, if you learn how to execute them and keep them in mind, you just might they just might save you from a tough bind. So yeah, chip damage. Uh, as it says, chip damage hurts you when you're guarding, which is really annoying when you're in a match. Uh, but you can't kill with chip damage. So it's a bit like fireballs in in Street Fighter and Tekken. They they will hurt you, but they don't they can't kill you. Um, I think a Street Fighter can kill you, uh, sorry, a Fireball in Street Fighter can kill you, but chip damage, for example, in Tekken, chip damage can't kill you in that game, same as in this game. And you still have to finish them off the old-fashioned way. Um, I like the fact that one thing I didn't know was if they're soul charged, using reversal edges or GI against them is a good way to stop them. I didn't know, I didn't think of that before. And I'm pleased that Perfect Guard is back in the game. That is done on absolute frame timing. Really hard to do. Special inputs. Advanced inputs. In this game, you don't have to wait for your character to recover and be able to move in order to input your next attack after a period of mobility. If you already know what move you want to use next while your character is immobile, you can go ahead and put it, input it in advance. The game will then remember this input and execute it immediately once your character can act again. These are called advanced inputs and are extremely useful for when you want to make a move as soon as possible. They can also be used during combos to improve your chances of successfully executing them. Uh, don't worry too much about the exact timing of advanced inputs either as long as you put them a little earlier than normal. Uh, the game will register them and activate the technique when your character is allowed to move. Delayed inputs. When inputting a combo, conventional wisdom lend, uh, tends to say that it's best to input each command as quickly as possible. With some fighting styles, however, you can delay the input for a, del uh, for a technique. Doing so will widen the interval between attacks in the current attack chain. These delays can be used to trick opponents into thinking you've stopped a combo in the middle of the sequence, faking them out before you hit them with the next attack. You can check the notes for each move in the move list for your fighting style to see which ones can be delayed. Just Effect A Just Effect is a type of buff that can be triggered with some moves within certain fighting styles by inputting them with specific timing. It's a just frame. In most cases, a Just Effect is activated by inputting the next move in an attack string right as the previous one is connecting with the other fighter. Just Effects do all sorts of things, such as increasing attack damage. You can check which moves have a Just Effect by consulting the move list for your fighting style. Just Effects are an advanced system uh, that are designed for experienced players. Once you feel comfortable with the basics of how your chosen fighting style plays, you should consider learning which moves have Just Effects and how to trigger them. Um. Uh, right, bear with me two seconds. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay, I 
that bit quick enough. Crouching. After use, using uh, oh, special inputs, supplementary info. Crouching. After using moves such as down A or down K, you'll sometimes find that your character enters a crouching position. This can also forcibly happen after guarding against certain attacks, such as strong downward swings. While crouched, bear in mind that the moves that you execute after inputting a command will differ slightly from those while standing. If you don't press direction while pressing any attack button, uh, you'll attack while standing back up. If you press either down back, down or down forward and any attack button, you'll perform a crouching attack. Note, you can still do reversal edge, critical edge and A plus B attacks and throws directly from a crouching position. Performing standing attacks from a crouched position. As mentioned in the previous section, attacks performed while crouched differ from those while standing. For example, A becomes rising A while down A becomes crouching A. Your options aren't just limited to rising and crouching attacks while your character is crouched, though one way to get around those limitations is by using a direction other than down back down or down forward while inputting an attack like forward, uh, forward attack, up forward attack. As an example, while crouched, if you input forward B, you'll perform a move that is uh, that as you normally would because there's no alternative version of it while crouched. So while standing and while crouching, your forward B will be the same. Another method to get past crouching limitations is by using what are known as forced standing inputs. These are performed by inputting either back or forward as an advanced input for a step after doing an attack that returns you to a crouched position. Doing this allows you to bypass the stand recovery window for the attack as your character performs a step. Once your uh, character is stepping, you can unleash standing attacks again by pressing an attack button as usual. Advanced inputs for 8-way runs. You can only enter a forward forward command or a back, oh, sorry, forward hold forward command or a back hold back command if you wish to execute an 8-way run as an advanced input. Down hold, uh, down back hold down back, down hold down, down forward hold down forward, uh, up back and hold up back, up and hold up, and up forward and hold up forward cannot be directly input in advance. If you uh, advance input either of the valid commands, you'll execute a move after doing an eight-way run in a spe uh, specified direction for a set period of time. So yeah, what this means is for when you're okay, let's go back to the top here actually. Ba -ba -ba, crouching. So yeah, you can either do down and you can do down and eight to do a crouch move, or you can crouch and then do a crouching move, and it will pre pretty much be the same move. Um, in that way, you can still, as it says as well, in crouch you can still do reversal edge, critical edge, uh, break attacks and throws directly from crouch because you stand up and just do the move. Um, performing standing attack, yeah, there you go, that's what I just said, <laughs> from rising. So you're down A, while like while standing A is still the same as a crouching A. Uh, four standing inputs. Yeah, so if you know that the attack returns to a crouch position, then you can use that to bypass the stand recovery for the attack, as it's mentioned there. And eight-way runs, which advanced inputs were buffering an input from your last input, so you could do AA and then sidestep, for example. Um, so, oh, sorry, AA. For an advanced input, you would do, say, AA, forward, hold, forward, and then you would do AA and advance into the enemy because of the eight-way run that you've buffered. Uh, ring walls and cliffs. High and low walls. On many stages, you will come across high and low walls placed throughout the ring. The difference between the two types is that with high walls, you can't push an enemy over them and win due to a ring out. Whereas with low walls, you can do just that if you can launch the enemy up and over them. When positioning yourself within a ring, be mindful of where any walls are as well as their height so that you can plan accordingly. Destructible walls. Beyond differences in heights, some walls can also be broken, while others cannot. Destructible walls will collapse and disappear if you push an enemy into them. Once the wall is gone, the cliff behind it will be revealed, at which point you or the enemy can be knocked over the edge and ring out as normal. Typically, most walls that are destructible will break after either fighter is pushed into them once, but there are some walls that will take a few hits before collapsing. Finally collapsing. Floor and ground colors. When positioning yourself around a ring, you can determine how close a wall or cliff is based on the colouring of the ground underneath your character. 
If a wall or cliff is close to your current position, the colouring and pattern of the ground beneath your character will be different, the, uh, different than it normally is when you're standing in the centre of the ring. In other words, if the ground below your character looks different than usual, it means you're in danger of a ring out. Be careful when navigating these areas, lest you fall out of the ring. I didn't know that. But yeah, obviously high walls, you splat them, you can't go over. Low walls, you can launch over and still combo them and ring out. Some walls can be broken in one hit. Some take three or four hits to break. And with the part that I didn't know is that when you're on the ground, the, the ground around you changes color depending on how close you are to a ring out. I wasn't aware of that. But now I am, I will keep note of it. So yeah, I hope after all this, it's been a very long video, but I hope that this will help some of you from the absolute basics if you've never played a Soul Calibur game before.